Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and today we're dedicating our video to Rebecca and Robin that's doing all about the Great Fire of London and as with most events in history Worcester is actually linked to it. Now we know that it's very well recorded, the Great Fire is very very well recorded and most of it is down to this man here which is Samuel Pepys and he wrote a diary and it covered everything really it covered the events the specific events that took place it also covered where it began and where it ended and most people will know it began famously in Thomas Farriner's bakery the King's Bakery in Pudding Lane now it is linked to Worcester how is it linked to Worcester you will find that as we tell the story but to start with this is a map of London at the time of the Great Fire, 1666. As you can see, it's very, very overcrowded. There's probably one or two things that you may recognize. The obvious one is the River Thames, which is gonna play an important part in this story. And you will also recognize London Bridge. There is only one and people used to live on it years ago. Um, the best toilets in London, I always say, is the houses on London Bridge because most of those had a hole in the ground you go to the toilet above and it drop, just drops straight into the river below so it had flushing toilets as such what I always say though I would hate to be a person in a rowing boat or in a sailing boat going under London <laughs> Bridge you never know what's going to fall on you from above the other thing about London's uh, Great River, the River Thames, is it's pretty much full of sewage. Not as bad as it is later in history by the Victorian age, but there is a lot of sewage in there. It's not advisable to go and swim in it. People are getting fish out of it and eating it, which is a bit disgusting to be fair. But you will notice how close the houses are together. It was said at the time of the Great Fire, you could open your window on one side of the street and shake hands with the people on the other side of the street. Some people say when they walk around London, to London today, it's very difficult to see the sun or see the sky. Well, in 1666, it was the same thing. There was a lot of buildings all leaning towards each other, very tightly packed together. You wouldn't really be able to see the sky even in 1666. So we've got an overcrowded old city. The heart of it is down here, the old Roman and medieval part of London, but then you've got all these buildings all added on. It's a mass of sprawling buildings, endless amounts of buildings. Now, at nine o'clock on the 1st of September, 1666, Thomas Farriner, it is recorded, basically made sure the ovens were out inside the bakery, put out the candles, went off to bed. And that was it. That's the end of the story in theory the only problem is at some point after nine o'clock in the evening a fire broke out it is believed it started around about 1 a.m which is technically on the 2nd of september and i don't know if you can see just there i've colored in a house in red and the reason why i've colored it in red is that is pudding lane pudding lane that's the king's bakery just down from london bridge itself so we know that Thomas Farriner went to bed and around about 1 a.m. a fire broke out. It started as a small fire. Um, the only problem is with people asleep at 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, no one was really around to notice it. And the problem with buildings at that time, they're made of wood and inside those buildings, there is a lot of wooden items. So the fire will spread very, very quickly. And it did because the houses are so closely packed together one house burning set fire to the one next door and before long the whole street was ablaze we know the first casualty of the great fire of london was the maid of thomas farriner who refused to jump out the window the farriners got out of the house apart from the maid and then we know that the fire burnt for several days later even by the 5th of september 1666 the fire was absolutely huge there had been fires in london before but this was the great Fire of London. This is the biggest fire London had ever seen. Why did it burn like that? Why did it go more that way than that way? Well, it's mainly down to the weather. It was September, late summer, as we often say. It was very hot, it was very, very dry, and there was a wind blowing in that direction. So the fire was going to spread like wildfire, literally wildfire. 
Now, houses at the time were actually timber framed. Try not to use the word black and white because houses were not really painted black and white until, what, the Victorian era? So houses were made, as I always say, like the human body. We have a skeleton inside. Well, the houses have a skeleton and it's a timber framework held together with wooden pegs. And then in between all our bones, we've got muscle and ligaments. Well, I always say, that's the equivalent of the wattle and daub, which is how the buildings are made. The timber is what gives the building the structure and shape. This just fills in the gaps. It's a cheaper alternative. Wooden beams are placed in, and then you weave the wattle, the hazel work, in and out of the timbers. And then it's covered in a mixture of things, really. It's called daub. It's made up of mud, clay, horsehair, straw, and uh, cow dung as well. That's also thrown in there, which is flammable in its own right. In Africa, even in ancient Egypt, they were using cow dung as fuel for fires. So these houses were made of wood, the walls were made of sticks, and then you basically have the walls spread in a fuel, absolutely lethal. And then most of the buildings in London was using the cheaper alternative to uh, tiling of the roofs. And that was either uh, wooden shingles, which are like slates, but made of wood or thatch, reeds and straw on tops of the roofs. So you can imagine very dry summer, a wind blowing from one direction, a spark started around about 1 a.m. in Thomas Farriner's bakery that fire is going to spread through these wooden houses like anything. Some houses, richer houses, had wooden panelling inside the houses and also wooden floors. Uh, for the poorer houses, they had straw on the floor. How dangerous is this going to be? Luckily in Worcester, we were a little bit more intelligent, I always say. Even in the 15th century, there was laws made to prevent fires. Worcester had seen lots of really horrible fires, devastating fires that almost burnt Worcester completely uh, to the ground. Um, by the 15th century, at the Guild Hall, the guilds, the traders, the merchants who met there, actually made a list of laws, and they were known as ordinances. We would call it a bylaw today. And ordinance number 26 is an interesting one because it says here, no chimneys of timber be suffered nor thatched houses within the city. We had actually banned by the 15th century wooden chimneys. Yeah, believe it or not, people use them. And we had also banned thatch roofing to prevent future fires. This is in the 1400s. If London had done the same, we may not have had the Great Fire of London. Unfortunately, in 1666, the houses were packed very close together. There was a dry season. The wind was blowing in a certain way. There was some sort of fire in Thomas Farriner's bakery and it spread. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the fuel was literally the buildings. Within the buildings, there were wooden spoons, wooden cups, wooden plates, wicker baskets storing all sorts of things in, even candle holders that were made out of wood. There was so much fuel in 1666, that fire was going to be absolutely devastating. It's interesting that Thomas Bloodworth, the Lord Mayor of London at the time, when he was told about the fire that was spreading in the middle of old London, uh, he actually said something quite shocking. He actually stated that a woman could actually sit there, I'm not going to use his words, and we on it, to put it out. He actually thought it was a small fire. He had seen many of them previously. The only problem is this fire was getting big. Even King Charles II, the man that ran away from the Battle of Worcester in 1651, he also got very, very scared. And actually, if you believe the story, went into London and tried to deal with the fire. He ordered soldiers to start with to pull down the very houses that are burning. In other words, make a fire break. It's something that they do even in some countries, even today when there's big forest fires. And what he used was he ordered his soldiers to get grappling irons, the same things that were used on ships years ago. These were thrown into the buildings, into the timbers, and they were used to pull the buildings down. 
Fire hooks were also used for pulling down the burning thatch to try and stop the fire. The only problem is it wasn't doing enough. We know Samuel Pepys was getting extremely scared as the fire crept closer to his house to the point when he actually hid his favourite cheese and favourite wine in his back garden famous bit of the story. The only problem is, as I said, the fire just kept on spreading. There was so much wood. By the dockside, there was tar. There was also storage warehouses full of wood and timber and all sorts of things. And the fire just got worse and worse. At one point, they thought even the Tower of London would explode. And that was, after all, the nation's storage for all the gunpowder for its defence. However, there is a quick way of removing houses. What is it? Gunpowder. Yes, soldiers brought in gunpowder, packed them into houses, and the quickest way of destroying and removing houses is to blow them up. And that's exactly what he did. By the 6th of September, the fire did start to die down. There was a few little fires still burning away, but luckily by the 6th of September, the fire had actually slowed down to the point it was now being controlled. Why? The main reason is they managed to stop it by blowing up the houses. The other thing, they were dealing with small fires with chains of buckets, buckets going up and down from the river, pouring the buckets of water on the fire. Also, the weather. In the Spanish Armada in 1588, the weather is partly to... Uh, we have to thank the weather mainly because it helped stop the great uh, the, the, the Armada. But uh, in the Great Fire of London, the weather also helped stop the Great Fire. The wind started to die down. So luckily, the fire almost burnt itself out. Now, we are linked to the Great Fire of London. It is quite interesting because we've actually got documentation stating that Worcester sent £230, 13 shillings and 9 pence to London. And that was sent by the parishioners of the city to actually help with the relief of the poor and the people who had lost houses. Because literally there were so many houses destroyed. Amazingly, there was only about four, possibly five casualties of the Great Fire. And when you think of the amount of devastation it caused, it always amazes me. Four or five casualties, that's all we know about. Anyway... That's the Great Fire of London, a whistle-stop tour of the Great Fire of London with some of the key points involved in it. Now, tomorrow is Sunday, and what we like to do on a Sunday is a craft. Not every week, but we like to do a craft on a Sunday. So what do you need if you're going to do this craft? Well, first of all, you need some paper, probably a square about this size. I wouldn't do it any bigger, so about 15 centimetres by 15 centimetres. You also need some string. That's going to be quite useful for this activity. You also need some scrap paper and a pair of scissors. So 15 centimetre square of paper, some scrap paper and some string. And if you tune in tomorrow, you will have a go at making a toy that they even played with in 1666. We're making a paper one, the original ones at the time of the Great Fire, was obviously made of, you guessed it, wood. Anyway, stay safe, stay in, join us for tomorrow's craft and see you soon.